Professor Rajiv Gorda, it's an honor to have you on this week's episode of Swadeshi Videshi. Uh, just to quickly summarize, uh, Swadeshi Videshi is an effort to dispense information that's happening within India to the over 180,000 uh, students that study all over uh, the world, as well as the large diaspora members that we don't have a number for um, because Indians are so spread out. And I think this is a particular honor for me because I think you have been uh, ingrained into the American education system and then have gone back. And, and I just wanted to say uh, it's a truly an honor and a pleasure. Well, thank you, Sudanshu. Uh, it's uh, a fascinating initiative that you've undertaken here. And I look forward to communicating through you to this large community of students and the diaspora. Fantastic. So just for our listeners who... Just for our listeners who... Uh, aren't aware, I wanted to introduce you. You obviously are an honorable member of parliament representing the state of Karnataka in the upper house, the Rajya Sabha. And uh, something that's of my interest is you are the chairman of the research wing um, of the Indian National Congress. Um, first off, Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, first off, what is uh, the research department and what does it entail? Our uh, Congress president, Rahul Gandhi, is busy remaking the Congress party uh, into a 21st century political organization. And one of um, the new divisions that's been um, established, maybe you could say that many, we have been given a mandate, is re reasonably uh, maybe a threefold mandate, or that we provide support to all our members of parliament. So anything that comes up before parliament, we, we make sure that our MPs are well briefed on the topic, on possible criticisms, things like that. Another agenda of ours is to hold the government accountable with, you know, using facts and figures, data, analysis, things like that. And so we do come out with numerous uh, publications um, you know, on the performance of the Modi Sarkar. It, uh, our flagship was a document called The Real State of the Economy, mm -hmm. which really showed how terrible this government's performance has been on the economic front and what a lost opportunity it's been for India. And the third uh, agenda that we have is ideation for the future. Mm -hmm. And so now this part of my work is morphing with my new role as uh, the convener of the manifesto committee of the party. So essentially uh, our job is to you know, source ideas, engage with people you know, in, at the grassroots and in the ivory tower, mm -hmm. um, in India and outside, everything, just to ensure that we come up with an agenda for action mm -hmm. and we are able to sort of cast this into a narrative which will touch the minds and hearts of the people of India, especially in the next election. Now, for listeners in the United States or listeners in the United Kingdom, uh, this is kind of different because when you, you know, what you describe is a think tank. Uh, mm -hmm. of sorts, and a think tank that is uh, kind of, uh, you know, when we think about research, it's a lot of the back room, the dirty dealing, kind of getting uh, dirt on a... Research uh -huh. in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, no, Rahul Gandhi is actually very insistent that we stick to the, when we are attacked, we are mm -hmm. attacked personally, we are attacked in a very, very, um, uh, you know, by the other side, the mm -hmm. ruling party and its minions, in its troll army, and um, uh, the BJP and its larger parivar mm -hmm. loves to... Uh, you know, you wallow in in some ways. Questions: uh, Fake news or disinformation? I think uh, someone who has seen it in India and someone who uh, a bit of a difference because I feel as if fake news in India is incubated and started by its WhatsApp forwards, whereas mm. in the United States, it's not necessarily from mainstream media. Or is it from a you know a local WhatsApp uh, source feed? Do you have you seen that difference? And, and critical of him is fake news. Right. So I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure what qualifies as fake news in mm -hmm. the United States is uh, like what you describe. Um, there are fake news factories which mm -hmm. are out there full of a fake news factory, and uh, they keep cooking up, you know, sort of fantastic, or at creating hostility mm -hmm. between different religious communities mm -hmm. and uh, set of fake news. There have been other sets of fake news that are focused on just spreading rumors, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. right? And so what both these kinds of fake news have led to mm -hmm. is a certain amount of willing to give credence to these WhatsApp forwards, which are, um, you know, which have no connections. You go into some village to do research and uh, there's, there's a WhatsApp, uh, you know, circu message circulating saying that there's a guy out here trying to keep questions or listen to your, uh, you know, entreaties, they will beat you and kick you till you dare. 
-hmm. Okay, so lynching and stuff like that just doesn't create any, um, you know, you know, basically people have got inured to it. People who are being lynched on suspicion of kidnappers, tomorrow someone else for some other reason. The new normal in India is be careful, you never from this government's, um, you know, it's sort of con condemnation of... Uh, uh, you know, the comparing of, of comparing of the fake news here and the fake news there. Here, like as you said, uh, kind of a doubt on the institutions, right? Whereas in uh, in India, it's a fear of, on your day. Um, which one's which one's scarier in a way? Which well, one's? I think the Indian one is scarier to uh, you know preempt because you don't know where these forwards are going on what's happened, where it's easy to police or to prevent. So that's the real challenge. Um, but some of it in India elections comes up with all sorts of ahistorical you know errors, and we will be, the Congress supported the wrong side, <laughs> and we must punish them. You know that stuff like this. You yeah. know cooks up stuff, right. okay, and uh, tries to create uh, enmity or hostility towards other political legitimizing what was accepted fact, and uh, you know, and over time giving um, the mob an opportunity to counter and attack. Now it's working. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, let me just go back to the question. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, what you're doing right now. I wanted to kind of uh, get into the past a little bit, uh, and specifically your academic work. Um, in my MSc dissertation, uh, I actually cited you and um, your uh, chapter on uh, the state of democracy, where you talked about the um, political parties and the power. Um, in that chapter, that specific chapter, I think you co-authored that. Hmm. Um, just a real quick question, and then we'll move on. Um, I f one thing that you state is, and, and I, I, I had a tough time kind of digesting this, is have political parties deepened uh, democracy or um, eroded it in a way because of the way that they function in India? Oh, uh, yeah, it's a mixed answer to that. You know, democracy is now, uh, you know, deepened because of the Panchayati Raj system. At every level, people get a chance to participate, vote, um, uh, you know, contest and elect their own candidates and run governments at different levels of uh, subsidiarity, you might uh, call it. So uh, the, the, the basic situation is that, in that sense, the system has made every Indian a stakeholder in democracy. However, democracy has also eroded because of the loss of legitimacy of various political parties, because of corruption, because of a variety of other factors that make people lose their idealism, their hope, um, you know, their um, sense of belief in, um, uh, you, know, in, in and, you know, in politics as a redeeming force. It's often becoming, um, you know, sort of an um, uh, capturing force, capturing resources, uh, siphoning off um, uh, funds, you know, things like that, mm -hmm. and in some cases, perpetrating violence, you know, so these are all, um, you know, but that's all part of the larger contestation mm -hmm. in a democracy. So one more question just off of that. Um, I know as an academic, your opinion on political parties, right? Has that changed once you uh, got into the system, once you were in active politics, um, your opinion on them and how uh, political parties function? Um, actually, I have tremendous respect for politicians and political parties. Mm -hmm. I had that, um, you know, before. I still have that. And a lot of my political writing is informed by the experiences that I've had within at least one political party and as part of the largest uh, political consulta con contestation that I used to see. So what typically used to happen was that every once in a while, when maybe I was denied a ticket or something like that, mm -hmm. I would have the time and space to take a step back and think about the big picture of what happened, what didn't happen. And in that context, I was able to come up with the insights that I've shared in the academic literature. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I, it's dramatically changed. Or what I have um, probably learned in the four years plus that I've been in parliament is that um, you know it's like a tremendously challenging job to be an effective parliamentarian, to understand how to how the government runs, how to improve it and make it more effective, um, uh, you know, and and how smart my colleagues are across the board in terms of their you know raw um, understanding of the way the world works, 
their um, ability to get to the root of an issue and their ability to also deliver um, you know, in various ways to the people. Uh, now this section, the ending concluding section, um, is, is for us. And when I say us, I think that, Professor Gorda, with all due respect, you're one of us. Us meaning um, these students who migrate from India, um, come here to study, um, sometimes make a career for part-time and then want to go back eventually or are in midst of their academic career. So I thought this would be, this section would be a little bit relatable to understand, um, you know, kind of your background. Um, first of all, what made you get into academia after graduating in Bangalore and coming to Fordham? And so I actually came to study public policy. And I wanted to study public policy in America because America does a very, very good job, the universities here, of um, taking uh, you know, real world challenges and turning them into teachable lessons in some ways. So the, the MBA is a very practical degree. Lots of policy programs also are very practical degrees. So they're not lost in theory. They, I mean, there's a certain element of theory, uh, but they're also very practical and very useful knowledge for people who want to be in the political space, who want to be ministers, who want to do good work. So, so American higher education is really un, you know, unsurpassed in its quality and in its you know, practical connect with reality. So, so I wanted to do that. Um, you know, I finished my master's at the age of 21 in one year. And I thought a PhD would give me even more expertise. And the brochure said, four years. <laughs> <laughs> and it took... Uh, Was that the biggest lie ever? <laughs> <laughs> well, it took me six and a half, actually. But, uh, but uh, you know, and uh, a part of the delay, I think, was because in the beginning, I was torn between uh, the di directions that a PhD was taking me. Right, a PhD in America is substantially, uh, you know, taking you in the academic direction, mm -hmm. while I wanted to be um, a more executive-focused guy, right. and so I was. I spent a lot of time agonizing over which pathway to follow, but um, you know, PhD is where the funding is, and so <laughs> you sort of go uh, with that path uh, for some time. And I also happened to luck out. I discovered professors who were doing really interesting policy research focused on the real world, mm -hmm. right? How does, you know, why are there certain risk-related conflicts? Why, how do people behave in reality? Can we set up an experimental setting and observe that? Forget what the theory says. Why are there, there's this whole field called behavioral decision-making. Mm -hmm. How do people, de de you know, deviate from this ideal of rationality? So the implementation of those yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, so all these things were, you know, all came together right. and in a very interdisciplinary manner. Mm -hmm. And I just fell in love with the research, with this cutting-edge exploration, and have been enjoying academia ever since. And, um, and then, of course, the academic environment in the United States takes you and pushes you and to the limits of your capabilities, mm -hmm. and then some more. Okay, okay? and uh, not just during the PhD program, but during the tenure track. And so I was, I stayed long enough to be tenured and promoted, and after that I think we internalize productivity, we internalize creativity and innovation, um, the knowledge creation that is, uh, you know, essential to the academic life. And so even now I can't stop uh, you know, producing knowledge in that sense. And it's a joy to be part of that. I just wish, looking back, that I had been more effective in writing so much more and, you know, in being more um, academically impactful. Mm -hmm. But that one piece with the, um, you know, the work on electoral financing that I have written with Sridharan, mm -hmm. um, you know, is credited with triggering a whole body right. of literature. Um, uh, you know, outstanding intellectuals like Prathabhana Mehta and Ashutosh Vajni call it the best on the subject. Mm -hmm. So for a guy who hasn't done huge <laughs> amounts of books or something like that, I'm still a happy man yeah. <laughs> for, in terms of my academic life. But I do think that the one thing to watch out for is that um, America, you know, has the you know, magnetic pull of a black hole. You know, it's difficult to break out of its um, uh, out of its thrall. And when you want to go back to India and make a difference there, you have to find, con you have to be mindful mm -hmm. of um, uh, you know of the fact that you could very very soon become. Um, very well settled here, mm -hmm. and you might not be able to make that move back, okay? And that could be because of family reasons, money reasons, whatever right. the case may be. It's, there is a sacrifice involved in breaking free. I 
took uh, the decision to resign my tenure. Mm -hmm. And now when I was getting elected to parliament, I resigned my professorship as mm -hmm. well. So basically, you know, there are, you know, these are leaps into the unknown. Mm -hmm. I don't advise that for everyone, but sometimes, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you need to make those, uh, uh, those really hard calls. One thing about your academic background is where you taught University of Oklahoma. So when people think about you know the United States, uh, they hold it as like you know a beacon of progress, development, liberalism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, obviously, with its you know caveats like Trump, but you've stayed in you know this uh, uh, the Corn Belt as people call it, referred in Oklahoma. I was uh, I was at born in University or in Alabama, so I feel that. So um, you know, what's the difference that you would suggest to students that are coming back and forth that only see New York, LA, and these hubs, and what real America is? Because my 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 intention is is are there issues that we you know don't see as Indian students in these cities but exist in rural America uh, that we hold to another pedestal when comparing to India? Um, you know, I mean, the, the ideologically these areas are very, very different. Mm -hmm. But I um, was at a university campus mm -hmm. and university campuses tend to be a little more diverse right. and the campus town tends to be a little more liberal. And in that sense, I don't think I necessarily experienced uh, the heartland mm -hmm. in the way that uh, you might have growing up in Alabama. But um, uh, certainly there were times when you know, there was something called an Oklahoma City bombing that took place at that time for the first couple of days when we didn't know who the perpetrator was. Mm -hmm. It turned out to be a white man. Um, there was a lot of suspicion in the air. And anyone who looked different you know, was greeted with tremendous hostility. And as a result, basically, I would say that it was... Um, uh, you know, those were the only times we really felt somewhat uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, America has um, has always been a very welcoming country and uh, plays, uh, you know, and, and one thing, in terms of as a professional, mm -hmm. I was able to go to the best universities in America, get into academia at the highest levels mm -hmm. without ever feeling that I was from some other country mm -hmm. or uh, didn't belong. I even got to teach American politics to American soldiers, you know, so what the hell. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, <clears throat> America's very good at absorbing talent. Last two questions, and oh. I promise I'll leave you alone. <laughs> um, w one thing is, is now that you've been, uh, as a student, you've seen that life, and now as a uh, official in the government of India, as a member of parliament, uh, where do you think the government can provide uh, for its students outside and abroad? Because there are 180,000 students that study every year outside of India, and uh, they feel sometimes disconnected. Um, so where do you think we can better from that? Because uh, in, in Trump's America specifically, uh, the largest amount of uh, ratios in terms of attacks that have been have been on Indian students in America. Um, obviously not maybe because they were specifically going for them, but when you know a perpetrator like, attacks, he doesn't ask you what your race, religion, yeah. ethnicity is. Do you, I mean, is there no, something? No, I, I don't. I think you should talk to your fellow students mm -hmm. and uh, crowdsource a set of ideas mm -hmm. on what can be done share them with us. I'll also think about it. I've not really thought of anything other than maybe some kind of um, social platform that connects people and, mm -hmm. um, you know, builds bridges. Um, uh, yeah, something like that. I, th I think there may be other ways. And um, Just to vocalize those concerns. Right, right, right. Let's, let's hear from the students and the people having their own experiences now. Right, on that, thank you so much for coming on Swadeshi Videshi, and uh, it was a privilege talking to you, sir. Thank you so much. you enjoyed the conversation that we had today. We're bound to make mistakes, but we'll only learn and get better from here. Now, if you want to take part in Swadeshi Videshi, any questions, suggestions, or just want to tell me how much you love Swadeshi Videshi, contact me on Twitter at Sadanshu Kaushik. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode of Swadeshi Videshi. We hope you learned a little bit more, not just about India, but Indian. And we'll be back next week with another episode in hopes of bringing Indians closer to